Good morning and welcome to another Ainsdale Evangelical Sunday service. Today we have Anthony Royal from Woodhill Baptist in Colwyn Bay preaching for us. But in the meantime we'll start off with a portion of scripture. This morning's scripture is from Hebrews chapter 9 verses 1 to 12. Now even the first covenant had regulations of divine worship and the earthly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one, in which were the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread. This is called the holy place. Behind the second veil there was a tabernacle which is called the holy of holies, having a golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden jar holding the manna and Aaron's rod which budded and the tables of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. But of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Now when these things have been so prepared, the priests are continually entering the outer tabernacle performing the divine worship. But into the second, only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing, which is a symbol for the present time. Accordingly, both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make the worship perfect in conscience. Since they relate only to food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until a time of reformation. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Amen. Amen. And our first song today is Majesty, Worship His Majesty.
Lord doth magnify the Lord.
Thank you, Father God, for your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for his obedience to the cross. We thank you for that precious sacrifice that wasn't just poured out for a certain amount of people, but for all, for the many, not for the few. Lord, we bless you and thank you for that this morning. And Lord, we pray for a blessing upon Anthony now as he comes to preach to us. In Jesus' name, Amen. This morning we're going to be looking at the book of Leviticus, the book of Leviticus, and we're going to be in Leviticus chapter 1, and we'll be looking at the burnt offering, the burnt offering, no, not to your wife's cooking, but it is one of the sacrifices unto the Lord, um, and I want to say this before I begin, it's, it's, it's very difficult preaching, um, especially during this time, I think. Uh, a lot of things been going on in the world and it's so difficult not to want to comment on those things and, and get into those things. Um, but I think it's best sticking to God's word. It's best sticking to God's word. And hopefully this morning we'll be looking at these things. We, we want to comment on things that are going on and make some practical applications during these difficult times. But Leviticus is one of those books that's become quite popular to read at the moment. I think a lot of people want to know a bit more about those purity laws um, want to know about these 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 things that are going on and um, I think a lot of people have, have delved back into the book of Leviticus but for some time a lot of people have avoided the book they don't particularly it's not one of those books that we go to for our devotion time you know we, we, we like the Psalms a bit of encouragement Proverbs bit of wisdom you know, those epistles of Paul, some life practical application. I think a lot of Christians uh, tend to gloss over um, very much the, um, read Genesis and maybe the first half of Exodus, but Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, we tend to gloss over those things. And uh, this morning I want to begin, before we get into the message proper, just really make a defense for Leviticus and why Christians should really uh, read this book and, and um, the benefit and how edifying it can be to the Christian uh, life. You know, we, we, we see these long detailed sacrifices, the instructions to the priests, all these things we, we, we tend to think, well, that's, that's not really necessary for me. It's not really um, something for the Christian today. You know, we quite often think, well, the law, that's for the Old Testament. That was for Israel. That's for the Jews. For Christians, is, is it so relevant for me? And I want to begin by saying, yes, it is. I think um, every Christian should uh, read the first five books of the Bible. Yes, we should read the law. First of all, it, it's the word of God. It's the word of God. Um, every piece of scripture is God breathed and is profitable for edifying the body for rebuke and uh, and everything that the apostle paul uh, says but also it, it's it's the book of the early church as well the the early christians would read uh the the law they'd read torah they would um read into uh those passages of scripture and apply those things to their lives you read the new testament and we see in uh in in the gospels and in the epistles um just the, the, they'd quote Leviticus again and again and again and um, and, and apply those things to uh, for the readers' lives. You know the the Bible speaks positively of the law. Psalms that itself says that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The Apostle Paul himself says he upholds upholds the law, and I think sometimes we get into this thing of like, well, law versus grace law versus um what jesus has done on the cross for us and i think um we've misinterpreted the law we misunderstood what the law is about and the usefulness of the law and how we can apply um, the, the first five books of the bible to our lives especially the book of leviticus and there's many passages in the new testament that quote from the book of leviticus in fact the second greatest commandment of all Leviticus 19 verse 18 says, Love thy neighbor as thyself. It's foundational. It's one of the, the most important uh, commandments in Scripture, straight from the book of Leviticus. It's foundational for Christian living. You know, Jesus and the apostles read 
this book and apply it to our lives. And we as Christians in the 21st century are no different. We must apply it to our lives. We must read uh, this book. I guess one of the difficulties we have as 21st century Christians is how to interpret this book, though. I always find that people have difficulty interpreting much of the Old Testament. Anyway, I know that in some churches the Old Testament really isn't preached that much because, well, they find it difficult to understand. They don't understand the context and the relevancy of it. But I, I believe that um, we can do it, that there's things that we can use in order to... Um, glean from this book as Christians we can really focus on what the Lord wants to say through this book I don't want to spend a lot of time going on to interpretive issues this is a, a sermon one that is not a, a, an academic exercise as it were but I want to just uh, mention a few uh, things in in how we should look at um, Leviticus I mean we can read it literally these were these were laws to uh, the Levitical priesthood, they were um, commandments and instructions to the people of Israel. And, must, and, and I guess if we read it like that as a historical document, we can see you know, what God was doing in this period of time. But I, I, I believe Leviticus is so much more than that. It's just more than just a historical book or just a, a, a book full of rules and commandments. You know, how do we then apply these things to us in Colwyn Bay, North Wales, uh, 4,000 or so years later. But I think there's so many different levels in which we can interpret Leviticus. I think the other tendency Christians have is to look at it symbolically and typologically. We, we tend to just read Jesus into the passage. And I think that's brilliant. I think that's okay. And, this, and we see the, the, the New Testament writers do that uh, so often. They see how all these sacrifices point to Jesus and what he's done for us, his atoning sacrifice for, for us. But I think there's even so much more than that. We will look at those things during the course of uh, this series on Leviticus. But there's even more. There, there's so much more. There's so much depth and, and, and wealth to this book in which we can glean and and really grab a hold of and, and, and use in our in our lives we see throughout israel's history that they too had to wrestle with this book and how to interpret this book you through see throughout the old testament different contexts changed if you read the original context of leviticus it's to the priesthood uh, who had the tabernacle at this time who were in the wilderness and that context changed over time that the establishment of the temple things changed these commandments then had to be recontextualized we see during the exile period when uh, israel went into uh, captivity things changed they had to recontextualize leviticus then when they went back into the land, the, the second temple was, was, was built. And we see even Jesus and the Pharisees just um, sort of arguing over interpretations of, of books like Leviticus and of the law. Things changed. They had to recontextualize. And then post uh, 70 AD, when the, the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and uh, destroyed the temple once again, things changed. Okay. And as we look in the 21st century within our context, you know, how we read this is, is very important. And I think there's some principles in which we can uh, grab from this book, which may meet the needs of our lives. But sometimes we do go to extremes in just reading this book symbolically. But we can see from uh, this just short survey there that there's different levels in which we can read Leviticus. It's not just reading it one way. And I think sometimes we're a bit overwhelmed by our options in reading Leviticus that we just dismiss the book. You know, some people don't really like too many options. Uh, and I think we, we, we get a bit like that with Leviticus. You know, should we read it symbolically? Should we just read it as a historical document? But we can read it devotionally as well. And that's the way I believe that the New Testament authors read uh, Leviticus. So with that in mind, we're, we're going to look at Leviticus chapter 1. And we're going to look at the burnt offering. But before I get into the message proper, um, I'm going to go to the Lord in prayer and, and, and pray for this message. 
Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, just how you speak even today. Uh, Lord, these words were written 4,000 years ago, Lord. 4,000 years ago in a different culture, in a different land. And Lord, it has been preserved, Lord, for us. Lord, it's been preserved. You preserve your word. And Lord, it has tested the stand of time, Lord. There's been so many different uh, cultures who have uh, read this book and have interpreted this book. And Lord, yet your word stands firm and it stands to what it is, Lord. And Lord, uh, you make it even relevant even today, Lord. Your word changes not. Lord, you change not. You are the same God as you were 4,000 years ago with all your holiness and wisdom and grace and mercy, Lord. And Lord, we see the, the needs of the people, Lord, this morning. Even, uh, Lord, the, the needs of the people back then are not so different to that of now. So, Lord, I just pray, Lord, for this message, Lord, that you would uh, just grab a hold of people's hearts, Lord, that you would just speak to us. Lord, that you would uh, use this message to encourage us and to transform us. Lord, even chastise, Lord. There's some areas of our lives, Lord, that are just not right. And I just pray, Lord, that you just have your perfect will and way. Pray and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you turn in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 1, we'll read the first two verses and then we'll just make some comments as we go along in uh, this in this message. And the word of God says this. And the Lord called unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, ye shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. You know, even from the first couple of verses there, we tend to just gloss over it. Oh, look at this as a sacrifice. Oh, I'll skip to where, oh, the book of Joshua, there's a bit of a narrative that we can read. But we see, if we look closely, if we take the time to just look at the words and the principles of, this, of the words, if we take the time to just look at this text devotionally we can see a few things that we can pick out here first i just want to note the book the name of the book of leviticus in hebrew it means and he called which is the first uh, few words of the book and the lord called unto moses you know in the the the, the title leviticus we get it from the latin and the greek which means to the levites and i guess that makes it less personal for us I think that title Leviticus makes the book less personal. This is for the Levites. This is for the priesthood. But the Hebrew title, which is, and he calls, makes it personal to us. And I think really sums up what the book is about. I think it sums up what um, God is saying through this book. It's a book of calling. It's a book of calling. It's a book of his calling to us. Not just to the priesthood. Yes, he called the priesthood. He called the sons of Aaron for a specific job. But we see throughout the Bible that God calls us to service. What I like about this Hebrew title is that it's about God's calling. God's calling. And it's a book about how we are called. Why we are called. And what we are called to. You know, I, th I think a lot of us wrestle with our calling and, and what, what God has called us to, to do. I, I notice in a lot of conversations I have with Christians, some Christians who even been around for 20, 30 years, I don't know my calling, they say to me. I don't know what God has called me to do. Am I called to do this? Am I called to do that? Sometimes I think they're called to do something and really it turns out that they're not. You know, you, you tend to know them by their fruits. But God has called each and everyone generally to serve him, to serve him. And what I also want to note as well is that he's called us to, and we'll find this throughout this message, is that he's called us to holiness. 
There's a couple of words I want to just uh, highlight here in uh, the first uh, few uh, verses of Leviticus. And first I want to see in verse 1 that God spoke to Moses out of the tabernacle. He spoke to Moses out of the tabernacle. And that's very important. You know, when we gloss over the text, we tend to miss these important key details. And it's so important that God spoke to Moses through the tabernacle. The tabernacle was God's dwelling place with his people. He had uh, set up this tabernacle in order that his glory may dwell and that he'd be with his people. He designed the, the tabernacle in a particular way that he would be and dwell and fellowship and have communion. And here God communes with Moses through the tabernacle. He's speaking to him. It's the revelation of God. And God wants to reveal himself to his people at this present time. And he's revealing himself through the tabernacle and to the person of Moses. So we can see just from this first verse that God's intent through Leviticus is one of revelation. It's one of fellowship. And it's one of calling a people unto himself. That's very important to understand as we go along this series and we look at this book. That it's about this calling that God has this calling to have fellowship with him, to, to, to have this personal relationship with a people. But there's a problem. There's a problem. As much as Leviticus is about communion with God, as much as it's about him calling us and, and wanting fellowship with us, <coughs> it's also about separation too. You know, we read the Bible and there's a lot of wonderful things about inclus inclusivity. Um, but there's also bits about separation as well. God is a holy and just God. As much as the tabernacle represented God's presence, <coughs> it also highlighted how much we are still separated from him. You know, the message of Leviticus is about Yes, um, God dwelling with his people, having fellowship, bringing people, uh, calling people to a specific way of life and to, uh, and to follow and honor him. But also it, it just highlights just really how separated we are from this holy and just God. You know, there were curtains separating different sections of the tabernacle. You know, certain sections not everyone could go into. Like even with the Holy of Holies, only the, the high priest once a year could enter into it. As much as it was about the presence of God, it really just demonstrated just how far we were. And you know, look further about all these purity laws restricting certain people from coming in. These acts of sacrifices that needed to be atoned for sin. It just shows as well, not just the, the holiness of God, but it also shows our depravity as well. See, the revelation of God makes it not just about himself. It, it does make it about himself that he is holy. And this is what God really wants to, 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 for us to know through this book, that he, he is holy. You can think about all these other characteristics of God. Pastor's been looking at different uh, characteristics about God <coughs> over the past few Sundays. You know, God is love. God is merciful. God is grace. And those things are wonderful, but I think sometimes in modern Christianity we forget that God is also holy. God is pure. God is righteous and he is just. And I think we forget that sometimes. But because of that, because of that truth, when he does call us, then it demonstrates his love as well. Demonstrates his grace and his mercy. It just shows how, how vast and wide it is. Because I think, you know, well, you can't know God's grace unless you know his holiness. When you see just how holy he is and how wonderful he is and how pure he is. And yet he calls us 
sinners. And he's forgiven us. But what a revelation that is. That not only that he is holy, but that we're not. We're not holy. That we were born with sin. We weren't born sinless. We weren't born pure and, and innocent. This book is a call to holiness. It's a call to holiness. And God says it many times in, in, in this book. Leviticus 11.44 Ye shall be holy for I am holy. Leviticus 11.45 The next verse he says again Be holy for I am holy. 19 verse 2 20 verse 7 20 verse 26 Again and again and again He says be holy For I am holy. This book is a call to holiness. Not just to the priesthood. Not just to those who are in Christian ministry. Not just to, to pastors and deacons and, and elders within the church. But to every man, woman and child. We must remember that. You know, holiness is, not, is something that's not often preached on. Or even contemplated enough. You know, we, we, we don't tend to think in, in these terms. We think holiness, oh, that's, that's legalism. That's, that's something to do with the Old Testament. But yet God even calls New Testament Christians to holiness. We've tend to just thrown it out of the window. You know, some people put this false dichotomy between holiness and grace or holiness and love you know you can't have the two but yet god in his wisdom and in in, in, in who he is just manifests both at, at the same time we can learn that this call of holiness that god has called us to is one of both grace and mercy and is a loving call you know when people do us wrong you know, we, we get on our little soapbox and we become all sanctimonious and, oh, I would never do that and all this kind of stuff. You know, we, we're, we're not so loving. And we start thinking we're better than other people. But yeah, God doesn't do that. You know, his response to Adam and Eve in the garden, he could have just... That's it. But no, he made a way. He made a way of salvation for people. And he's called you and I. But not to come as we are. But to be changed and transformed to repent. The very fact that he wants to be with you shows his love. And the lengths that he makes to do it reveals not just his love, but his fervent love as well. He's so fervent, how he's pursued those, even how he's worked in uh, thousands of years of history, how he's revealed himself again and again and again to a people, how he's shown patience with just the people of Israel alone, how he, he, he sent his only son to die on a cross for your and my sins, just shows just the lengths that God goes to. You know, the first seven chapters of Leviticus are about different sacrifices. Different sacrifices. The first seven chapters, the burnt offering, the meat offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering. And I think God, right off the bat, really wants us to show how important these sacrifices are. You know, he didn't start with the purity laws and he didn't start with, well, you know, be good to your neighbor, be a good person, be nice. No, he, he wanted us to know how important sacrifice is, and particularly blood sacrifice. And I know this is a very difficult topic for, for some people, and it might be another reason why some people don't read Leviticus, because you know we live in an age which is very animal rights uh, and all this kind of stuff. But really, the and some of the graphic detail within 
uh, these sacrifices as well just shows us sort of how serious sin is and the lengths that God has has gone to to atone for our sins to uh, to make things right to, to to shed innocent blood for for those who were once guilty well, God is stating the importance of sacrifice. And now these sacrifices are mentioned before the before even the giving of the law is, you know, we see the sacrifices Cain and Abel. We see sacrifices that Noah gave a burnt offering. Abraham gave a burnt offering. But what God is doing with the book of Leviticus is saying, This is the way I want you to worship me. And I want to show what's important in this relationship that I have with you. And he starts with sacrifice. And he gives all these specific instructions on in how to go about these sacrifices and how they should be done and, and, and who should do them. And we'll continue our reading and uh, go back to uh, Leviticus 1 verse 2. We'll read through to verse 9. And we'll see some of these uh, specific details in which uh, God wanted the, the priest to offer up this burnt offering. He says, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, ye shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. So he means both cows and, and sheep and, and goats. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will, will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. And he shall kill the bullock before the Lord and the priests, Aaron's sons, shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood round about upon the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. And the sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire upon the altar and lay the wood in order upon the fire. And the priest Aaron's son shall lay the parts of the head and the fat in order upon the wood that is on the fire which is upon the altar. But his inwards and his legs shall be washed in water, and the priest shall burn all on the altar, and be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savour unto the Lord. It's very graphic, very graphic details, and uh, very difficult, I think, for some people to, to read. But herein is, is the way that God wanted to demonstrate the seriousness of, of, of sin. We see in this offering that it could be offered up in, in different animals. We've, we've got both uh, uh, bullocks and, and sheep and goats. And we see later on he, he talks about um, birds as well. But first, the, th the first thing I want to note this morning in verse 3 is that these offerings were male and without blemish. They were male and without blemish. You know, male cattle were very valuable in uh, in the ancient Near East. Um, they uh, were a valuable commodity. You know, my dad uh, has a farm in South Africa and he has his own herd of, herd of cows. And he'll tell you just how precious and valuable having a prized bull is in order to impregnate the cows to... To then have calves produce milk, you know, very valuable. There's, there's quite a lot of negotiation between farmers on, you know, on um, borrowing their, their 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 bulls in order to produce calves. They're very valuable. Not only were, were they there to to um, to produce calves and and to be amongst uh, the cows, but they also work the field as well. And typically, there's there's less bulls than than cows, so there's less males than females. So they're very valuable, very valuable. So when God says, oh, "I want this young bullock to be sacrificed to me," I want this 
one without blemish as well. You know, what he's saying to us is that he wants his very best. He wants our best. And he wants um, the first fruits. He, uh, we see this throughout Leviticus and throughout the Bible as well. He wants the best. He wants the first fruits. He wants that which is valuable unto us. Sometimes he wants to, to hit us where it hurts just so we know just how serious these things are. He also says unblemished. It just shows the, the, the standard of perfection that God has. He wanted it without blemish. You know, God doesn't want our casts off or anything like that. He wants what is pure. And this, this theme of unblemishment also goes along with his holiness, his, his pureness. Secondly, there in verse 3, I want to note that it was a free will offering. It was made voluntary. It says by their voluntary will. It wasn't something that was compulsory or you were obliged to do. You know, this is something that you had to do from your heart. And that's what God wants. He He, he wants our best. Really, he just wants our heart. He, he wants us to love him with all our mind, all our soul, all our heart. And this is what's really going on in this verse is that he he wants us to serve him in the way that he should be served but not not just out of duty you know sometimes we can do things dutifully you know a, a lot of people are, are carrying out their duties now but really a lot of the real heroes are those who who do things voluntary as well really shows a person's heart and a person's character and that's what god is trying to get to grips with here it wasn't necessarily just that the the, the the sacrifice of the bulls that were uh, important it's not just that the, these blood sacrifices are important they were but really the the, the heart of the issue the the, the 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 spirit of what god is saying in this is that he he just wants you to love him with all your heart mind and soul Thirdly, I want to note this morning that the sacrifice was an atonement. It was an atonement. It was for the cleansing of sins. A life for a life. Something that was without blemish for us who are with, with blemish. And we all have blemishes this morning. I don't know if you noticed this huge, uh, massive spot on my face. But we all have blemishes. Not just on the outside. But on the inside as well you know we're naturally a sinful people when we're born we're not taught how to sin we just we just do it we see here in this sacrifice that the priest laid hands on the head of the animal which is symbolic of sin being placed upon the animal then the animal is killed and it's atoning blood sprinkled around the tabernacle the altar and the door of the tabernacle you know, the offering was then burned, said it was slayed and then flayed and cut into pieces. The carcass was placed on a fire on the altar and its entrails were washed. They were washed. The inner parts of the animal was, was symbolic really of, it, of its life and, and, and they were washed. So God is is demonstrating through the sacrifice purity not just on the outside but also on the inside and that's what god wants to do in us he doesn't want us to just be all good people we're doing these nice things for people and uh, and being all good on the outside no he's really interested in in cleansing us and, and, and purifying us of just those thoughts that we have and and our sinful nature Look here in verse 8. This is what the sacrifice is to Almighty God. It says, That is a sweet savour unto the Lord. A sweet savour unto the Lord. You may think this morning of your uh, roast beef in the oven and the smell that it's, that it's making. You know, there's nothing better than a lovely cooked roast beef. And I imagine that the smell would have been not too dissimilar or, you know, the, the burning of the carcass and, 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 all, and all that would have produced a really lovely smell. But really it's just that symbolic of a, of a sacrifice, pure life, this, 
atonement being made, just being pleasing to Almighty God, one that satisfies him, one that um, brings uh, pleasure unto Almighty God. Now, this process of sacrifice and atonement satisfies a holy and just God. We read in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 22, that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Now, I think sometimes we find that difficult in today's culture to, to, to deal with. It seems, it seems barbaric to a lot of people. You know, the shedding of, of blood, even Jesus' death on the cross was ultimately barbaric. You know, I think it's one of the cruelest ways to die. It was a horrible way uh, of executing people that the Romans the Romans used. But God goes to those lengths to for something more precious, which is our soul. That's how precious our soul is. That even something so gruesome a death is necessary. And God provides a life for a life. You know, as in another um, passage in Hebrew, Hebrews, the, the author of Hebrews continues in chapter 10, verse 4, that the blood of animals were not sufficient enough. You know, the author of Hebrews goes on to, to comment on passages such, such as this and say, yes, God gave this 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 sacrifice but really at the end of the day it only got you so far they're able to dwell with God but only partially you know these sacrifices weren't really what God desired that they, they, they wouldn't completely take away our sins and you know, we see there in verse 10 of chapter 10 that the author says that these things were offered up again and again, you know, they could only appease and, and, and get you, you so far with God. But these things were a type to, 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 to demonstrate a greater offering that, that God had for us. And the author of Hebrews contrasts the, the, these sacrifices, these burnt offerings with the sacrifice of Jesus. He said, look, these, these burnt offerings were offered again and again and again and again, but yet Jesus died once. And for all. Dad once and for all. That's just the power of his sacrifice. That's how innocent Jesus was. You know, those people that the author of Hebrews was, was writing to were wanting to go back to the Old Testament laws, you know, going back to these different sacrifices. And he's saying, look, it's futile. Why are you doing that? It's so inferior to what we have now in Christ these things are all a type and a shadow but yet yeah, just just a shadow the real thing Jesus is so much more but we can learn from this sacrifice we can learn to see you know how it talks of God's holiness how it talks of, of his of his fervent love for us how it talks of the separation that we have now but yet God desires fellowship with us but in the sacrifice of Jesus, we have a greater call for holiness. We have a greater loving call. Even this burnt offering with all its ceremony, detail and expense in sacrifice was not enough. But it still reveals towards the extent of our sinfulness and the scale of his holiness. The extent of our sinfulness and the, and the scale of his holiness. The blood of animals only got you into the door of the tabernacle. Still separated. Still far off. But the blood of Jesus. That gets us into the Holy of Holies. That gets us who were Gentiles who weren't even allowed into the tabernacle 
not only in the door, not into the holy place, but into the holy of holies, right to the throne room of God. And the author of Hebrews says, well, let us come boldly to his throne of grace. And we can do that now through the precious blood of the Lord Jesus. But yet those words are also preached to New Testament Christians as well. He says, be holy for I am holy. And that's the challenge that I have for us this morning is uh, as we look on these things, as we look through this book, book of Leviticus, that we take on this call to be a holy people, a royal priesthood for him, to be a people of service to people who are committed completely for God you know he's demonstrated his love so much for us through the Lord Jesus he sent his only son to die on a cross for us he's paid the price for our sins he's atoned for it we have a free gateway to the throne of God yeah sometimes we don't listen maybe this morning you're not a Christian perhaps maybe you're one of my Facebook friends who have just uh popped on for a bit of a nosy and just wanted to see what this guy's rambling on about this morning uh, hopefully you've listened this morning of just how much God loves you that he's demonstrated it and that at the moment you you're far off just as we all were I was far off but yet he's given us this wonderful gift in Jesus and wants to have fellowship with us. You know, God dwelt with the children of Israel through a tabernacle and a temple. And he even dwelt among them for a short time in the person of Jesus. But yet for us Christians today, we dwell with God through the Holy Spirit. Because of the repentance of sins. Because of our declaration that he is Lord, that he is God. His spirit lives in us. And he's doing a good work in us at this time. And my prayer this morning is that you not get in the way of that work. That you're sensitive to the Holy Spirit's calling in your life. That you take the time to 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 just pursue into fellowship and have communion with him. Let's close this in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I, I just know that this is such a difficult message for this period of time. Lord, sometimes we do feel so far off. We're so cut off from our friends and our family at the moment. It's it's hard. Uh, Lord, maybe some people this morning might be feeling a bit cut off from you. But yet, Lord, you've revealed yourself to us through your word. You've revealed yourself to us in these last days through your precious son. And I just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would just work in people's lives and hearts at this time. Lord, that we take up this call. That we'd follow and pursue you. Help us, Lord, in our difficulties, in our sinful states. Help us, Lord, with those things that we're wrestling with in our lives. Lord, may you be glorified in and through us, Lord. And may we... Be holy as you are holy. We pray and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And for our last song is Man of Sorrows.
glad that we can sing that and we can sing it with emotion because it means something to us. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for atoning for our sins on the cross. We thank you that he was in our place. Oh Lord, your grace upon us, your mercy upon us, you took what we deserved. Lord, thank you. We thank you for this message today, Lord. Let us continually have our minds set upon you, focused upon you and your work at the cross. And we thank you once again for our church and our fellowship in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.